important notes about online learning. On the course page, you'll find a very useful document with some hints and tips on how to manage your data and to reduce your data consumption. Download the slides and go through them along with the video or audio and please pay special attention to the lecture outcomes. The outcomes tell you what you need to be able to do in order to pass the assessment. This means that the outcomes define the scope of your assessment. You still need to make notes and try and express things in your own words and this is going to be very important for your own understanding. You still need to go through the prescribed reading and do the exercises and you still need to explore further through additional reading, online investigation, for instance, YouTube has some wonderful linguistic resources. Remember that your evidence of engagement will all be part of your portfolio. Every lecturer hopes that all students do these things anyway. But when you are doing online learning from home, the opportunities to do so are quite different. It becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take responsibility for your own learning. Hold tight and enjoy the lecture. Evidence for syntactic structure from negative polarity items and introducing C command. First, briefly to summarize where we are in the module, we are looking at some of the formal characteristics of language, specifically the evidence for hierarchical structure. In the previous module, we looked at constituency and constituency tests. And having ascertained that constituency does exist, we're going to be looking at the relationships between those constituents and looking through the lens of something called C command. The first phenomenon we're going to be looking at will be negative polarity items, and we'll be following that up with agreement, binding, and minimality in subsequent lectures. One of the insights that we arrived at in Linguistics 1 was that it's not enough just to know the words of a sentence, but that there is a deeper structure that determines the meaning of a particular sentence. And we can illustrate this very quickly through a simple example like the cat nibbled the mouse, where the cat is the doer of the nibbling and the mouse is the undergoer or the patient of the nibbling. Now we know that there is some structure in the sentence because it's not possible to switch the words around into some kind of word salad, like the nibbled cat mouse the. This clearly doesn't have any meaning, and this suggests to us that there is some kind of structure underpinning the sentence. However, we can move some of the words around and still get a meaningful result. For instance, the mouse nibbled the cat, and in this example, it is the mouse that's the doer of the nibbling, and the cat that is the patient or the undergoer. All of these examples have one thing in common, that is, they use exactly the same words. And what these simple sentences demonstrate is that the words of the language are not sufficient to create the meaning of any particular sentence. Rather, what creates a sentence is the combination of the words and the structure that they are part of. This idea that the meaning of an expression is a combination of the meanings of the individual words and whatever features they may interact with, as well as the relationships between them, is known as compositionality. Now, while we can see the words written on the page or hear them, what we don't see or hear is the underlying structure. Another way of saying that would be what we can't see or hear is the broader compositional structure that they are part of. The structure has to be inferred from the way that words and constituents interact with each other, and that is going to be the focus of the next couple of lectures. In this lecture, we will explore the nature of the hierarchical syntactic structure more closely, providing additional evidence for this structure from negative polarity items. And in turn, we will be using these negative polarity items, also called NPIs, to explore the structure of language more precisely. As we go along, we will introduce the notion of C command, which is a relationship between constituents in trees that will become clearer as the lecture progresses. Let's start off with a puzzle. The first sentence I want to look at is, I went to Addo and I saw some elephants. In this example, the word sum in red on the screen is also known as a quantifier. And what a quantifier does is that it looks at the semantic set of elements and counts them. So if I went to Addo and I saw three elephants, then the quantifier sum would look into the set of elephants, count three, and work out that three is more or less the equivalent of sum. So these quantifiers do some semantic work involving counting. 
Now imagine that I went to Addo and I didn't see anything at all. I might phrase that as the following. I went to Addo and I didn't see some elephants. And while that isn't the worst sentence imaginable, there's a certain amount of awkwardness there because there is another way of phrasing it. Rather one might say, I went to Addo and I didn't see any elephants. In this example, the word any seems to be replacing the quantifier sum and is doing more or less the same type of semantic work. But where this is different to the word sum is that any seems to occur only in some restricted environments. The next sentence I want you to look at is I went to Addo and I saw any elephants, which is ungrammatical. And so we have two contrasts. In the first pair of sentences, we have a simple minimal pair looking at the quantifier sum first in a positive or non-negative syntactic environment and in the second in a negative syntactic environment. So this is a simple minimal pair. The second simple minimal pair relates to the quantifier any. In the first example we see that any is ungrammatical in a positive or non-negative sentence and the second example shows us that any is perfectly grammatical in a negative sentence. So together, these two simple contrasts make up a complex contrast or a complex minimal pair. Interpreting them together, we can see that some generally occurs in positive environments, while any only occurs in negative environments. In other words, there is an asymmetry in these examples. By the word asymmetry, we mean an imbalance or a difference in the way these words behave. Let's look at some more examples of this kind of phenomenon to try and work out what's actually happening here. Here are some more examples. Sue won't ever go there again versus Sue will ever go there again. The office hasn't notified anyone versus the office has notified anyone. Nobody lifted a finger to stop him versus several people lifted a finger to stop him. Or I don't suppose they'll lift a finger to help versus I suppose they'll lift a finger to help. He won't budge an inch on this issue versus he'll budge an inch on this issue. For all their efforts, the trailer never budged an inch versus after all their efforts, the trailer budged an inch. In all of these examples, one of the sentences seems to be somewhat better than the other. In particular, it's the sentences containing negation that seem to be pragmatically fine, whereas the ones that are not negated seem to be semantically awkward. All these examples contain a quantifier of some sort. For instance, any versus some, several, as well as couple that don't really look like quantifiers such as lifted a finger or budge an inch. These examples also contain a negative operator, which is also a type of quantifier incidentally. For instance, not, didn't, or nobody, etc. And in all these examples, the negation operator seems to be to the left-hand side in linear order of the quantifier. So it really looks like there is some kind of interaction happening between the negation on the one hand and a quantifier that is some way on its right. For the sake of having a nice word for these types of quantifiers that are licensed under negation, let us call them negative polarity items and we're going to shorten that to NPI for short. And this is a technical term that you will see in many readings. Let's have a look at a couple of other languages to see if similar phenomena apply, and they do. For instance, in Greek, I'm not going to try and actually say this, but you can read this on the screen. We can see in 1a that the quantifier is grammatical in the context of negation. In 1b, in contrast, we can see that there is now no negation, and the little star indicates that this is an ungrammatical example. So even though we don't know any Greek, we can infer from the example that tipota must be some kind of a negative polarity item. Example 2a shows a Dutch example where the phrase okma eats, which can be glossed more or less along the lines of also but something, is marked in green. And this is fine in a sentence that starts with a negation, niemand or nobody. In this example, you can see the negation affixed to the nominal nobody. However, when you contrast that to a positive sentence, uh, for instance, we replace nobody as a subject with something like Jan or Piet, then in that example, you'll see that this becomes ungrammatical, and this suggests that Okma eats is an NPI, or a negative polarity item, that needs a negation somewhere in the sentence, somewhere on its left. Next example is from Digo, also known as Chidigo or Kidigo. It's a language in Kenya spoken by about 410,000 people. Let's just take a moment to look at the glosses and what's actually going on here. 
So FV stands for final vowel, and this is quite common in a lot of Bonchi languages, uh, which have a consonant vowel, consonant vowel kind of structure. And so quite often, if a verb ends on some kind of a consonant, we'll add a final vowel of some kind just to preserve the CV, CV kind of structure. The ta is glossed as negation, and re is an agreement marker for noun class number five. The important part that we're interested in is the inceptive marker, which has been marked in green on the slides. And this more or less has the meaning of it has not yet pierced. What we can see from example 3b is that when the negation has been removed, then the sentence becomes ungrammatical. And this suggests then that the inceptive marker must be licensed by a negation, which is somewhere to the left-hand side of it. Let's look at a slightly more complex example of negative polarity items, this time from Isik Osa. And this evidence comes from Costens and Mleche. And you're welcome to go and look at the original paper that they wrote. And I've got the reference at the bottom of the screen for you. So if you want to say a simple sentence like, I saw children, you might say something like, Ndiboni abantwana. And the important part to look at there is the prefix a before bantwana. And this is also sometimes known technically as the augment. And what's interesting about the augment in Isinkosa and Zulu and a number of other languages is that sometimes it pops up and sometimes it disappears. And there's still quite a lot of debate about what the exact rules for that appearing or disappearing are. Of course, Carstens and Lecce have their own idea, and that's what we're going to look at right now. They contrast this example, which has the augment, to the equivalent example without the augment, Ndiboni Bantwana, which they claim is ungrammatical. And this is our first simple contrast, either the presence or the absence of the augment. Now let's look at another contrast, which is the presence or absence of the augment in a negative context. In the A example, it's the A, which is a prefix, which indicates a negation. And this is also mirrored by a verb ending, anga, which is a negative past tense as well. So, andi bonanga means I didn't see. And to say I didn't see the children, you could say andi bonanga abantwana. Or you can also say andi bonanga bantwana which more or less means something very similar. Importantly, though, the, the R prefix on the noun object, the augment, seems to be either optionally present or absent in the negative example. So we have two simple contrasts between the positive sentences and the negative sentences, and together we can make a complex contrast between them, which seems to show that, among other things, the augment is sensitive to the presence of a negation in the sentence. Quoting from the paper by Carstens and Lecce, they say, Closer nouns typically have two class prefixes. Without the outer prefix, which we call the augment, their distribution and interpretation are restricted in systematic ways. All speakers accept augmentless nominals in negative context and translate them with English any. On the other hand, no speakers accept them in positive assertions with a simple past tense. They also go on to look at some other evidence in Hossa and Zulu, pointing out some variation between speakers along the way. For the nuanced version, I think you should read the original paper. So although this doesn't behave in precisely the same way as a negative polarity item in some of the other languages we looked at, we can still see that we have a morpheme that is sensitive to the presence or absence of a negation, and that is the core phenomenon that I want to point your attention to. Moving on, how can we explain the patterns that we've just seen? So let's start off by just throwing some rough ideas together and we will make them more specific and precise as we go on. First of all, it seems that a negative polarity item must be preceded by a negation. In other words, a negation must be somewhere to the left-hand side of this NPI quantifier. It also doesn't seem to matter how many words are between the NPI and the negation. So this could be a local relationship where they are very close together, or it could be a long-distance relationship with the NPI and the negation are separated by several words. Let's explore this type of hypothesis with some of the data. So our first set of sentences we have seen before. I went to Addo and I didn't see any elephants versus I went to Addo and I saw any elephants. And this seems to be consistent with the idea that our negative polarity item must have a negation somewhere on its left-hand side. So the hypothesis seems to be confirmed. But if we're going to be good language scientists, we need to push our hypotheses to the limit 
and see if they are consistent with all the known evidence. So to do that, let's look at another kind of sentence, namely, no student would ever miss a tut versus a student who nobody likes would ever miss a tut. We can see that the second example is ungrammatical, despite the fact that the negative polarity item ever is also preceded by the negation nobody somewhere on its left hand side. So this is an example where although there is a negation to the left hand side of the negative polarity item, the sentence is still ungrammatical and this suggests that our hypothesis is incorrect. So it cannot be the fact that the negation must be before the, the NPI in linear order, so something else must be the case. To help us understand what is going on here, let us draw a couple of syntactic trees. Our first tree will be of I did not see any elephants. And perhaps it's a good idea for you to pause the video at this moment so that you can try and draw that tree by yourself. Once you've drawn that tree, I want you to try a tree for the following example. A student who nobody likes would ever miss a tut. Again, let's pause the video here so that you can try your own hand at drawing some trees like that. Right, so by now you should have two trees, and there do seem to be some differences between them. You'll notice that the sentence, I did not see any elephants, is a simple sentence, where the negation is inside the main clause. Now if you look at the other example, a student who nobody likes would ever miss a tut, we will see that it is actually a complex sentence because there is a relative clause inside the subject, a student who nobody likes. And who nobody likes is becomes its own s-bar tree. And what we notice is that the negation is within the embedded sentence. So this tells us, although in both examples the negation, not and nobody respectively, are indeed to the left-hand side of the quantifier, ever or any, the key difference between them is that in the one that negation is in a relative clause and that seems to trigger the ungrammaticality. Now, is there a way of making this intuition or general insight more precise? The answer is yes, absolutely. And at this point, we're gonna introduce the theoretical notion of C command. The formal definition of C command is the following. In the syntactic tree, A, C commands B. If every node that dominates A dominates B. Now, while that is the official definition, I want you to take a deep breath and pause right there. We're going to be using a much more informal definition and not engaging too much with this formal one, although you're welcome to try your hand at it if you want. The simple English definition of C command that I want us to work with is go up one node and then down, down, down as far as you need to go. I'll say that again. Go up one node and then down, down, down as far as you need to go. And incidentally, I am quite okay if you use that kind of definition in an exam or a test or assignment. I'll know exactly what you mean and that'll be absolutely fine. Of course, once you want to do your master's or PhD in syntax, then you might not want to use an informal kind of definition like that. But for our purposes, it is perfectly sufficient. And in fact, I would prefer that you use the simple English definition of C command, which I say is go one note up and then down, down, down as far as you need to go. As a bonus, let us do a little bit more practice with C command. I've drawn on the screen an abstract tree with numbers instead of linguistic labels. And let's try and practice to see if we understand how to apply this idea of C command. My first question is, what does node 8 C command? And from node 8, we go up one node that takes us to node 2. And then from node 2 downwards, we'll get to node 3, node 9, 6, 10, 7, 11, and 12. And these are all nodes that 8 C commands. Here's another example. What nodes, yeah. here's another example. What does 9 C command? From 9 we go up to 3, one up and then down. And from 3 as we go down, we can C command nodes 6, 10, 7, 11, and 12. And these are the nodes that are C commanded by 9. Last example. What does 15 C command? From 15, we go one up to node four, and from there down to five, 14, and 13, and these are the three nodes that are C commanded by 15. The skill of working out C command relationships gets better with practice, so give it a try in your own time and bring your questions up in your tutorial. So let's see what this means in practical terms. Let's start off with our simple sentence tree, I did not see any elephants, and we want to draw a map 
of the relationship between the negation head not and the quantifier any. So let's see what we would do there. We would start out with our negation head and move one node up, which is shown by an arrow, and then we go down as far as we need to go. And the question is, as we go down, is it possible to get to the constituent where our quantifier or our negative polarity item is? And the answer is yes, absolutely. By going one node up and then down, we can link the negation and the NPI. So this is basically how C command works. Let's see how this idea about C command applies to another example involving an NPI, namely, no student would ever miss a tut versus a student who nobody likes would ever miss a tut. So if we look at the tree of no student would ever miss a tut, what we'll see is that the negation occurs inside a noun phrase, no student, and our NPI quantifier is somewhere lower in the tree. So we start at the noun phrase constituent and we go up one node to S and then down, down, down. And it is indeed possible to link the category no student with an NPI by this method. And so we can see that this would explain why in this particular example, the NPI and its negation can be linked together using C command. Now let's look at the example, a student who nobody likes would ever miss a tut. Now, this was the key example that shows us that it is not the linear order between the negative polarity item and the negation that counts, but rather the hierarchical structure that is really making the big difference here. So let us apply C command to this particular tree and see what comes up. So just like in the previous example, the noun phrase subject does C command the rest of the tree, and you can link the noun phrase subject to a quantifier. However, the negation is not really inside the noun phrase subject in the first instance, but is actually inside an embedded S bar or an embedded sentence, which makes up the relative clause. So if you start out at the negation inside the embedded relative clause, by moving up one level, you'll probably get to S, and then you would go down, 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 but you would still be inside that embedded clause. Even if you manage to go up two nodes from the S to the noun phrase and then down, you still would not be able to get a relationship to occur between the negation and the negative polarity item using C command. So this tells us that the negation must be quote unquote higher up than the NPI, but that more specifically, the negation must C command the negative polarity item, and that it is not enough for the negation merely to be on the left-hand side of the NPI when it comes to linear order. Now, there is some danger in creating new theoretical constructs, such as this idea of C command, because ideally, we want our theory to be a set of tools that can be applied to a number of different languages and a number of different contexts. And this is another way of saying that if we have a general tool, it is going to be more useful in our syntactic theory than having a very specific tool that can only be used for one particular language or even only one particular construction inside one language. And so if we are suggesting that C command is going to be a syntactic tool that we want to use, we should be able to show two things. One, that we see similar effects in other languages, and we've already shown this on previous slides, where we showed that negative polarity items occur in a number of languages of the world. And the second thing we want to show is that C command is perhaps a general tool that can be used in other syntactic contexts as well. And for that reason, in our follow-up lectures, we're going to be talking about C command in agreement, C command in anaphoric binding and C command in transformations and movement. And hopefully by the end of the module, we will have amassed a variety of evidence which shows that C command is used in different languages and as a general purpose tool in different syntactic environments. And if we are persuaded by that evidence, then we will be in a good position to say that C command must somehow be part of universal grammar. And you will remember that universal grammar is why we are all here. Syntacticians naturally want to explain phenomena in different languages, but they also want to specify what general purpose tools are in the syntactic or the linguistic toolbox that occurs in every single speaker's mind.